Welcome everyone. In my earlier SG Octane video, I promised a disassemble and a look inside the machine. If you've not seen the earlier video, you may find it in the card above. First, let's see if it still works. Okay, it looks promising. As I said in the first video, and as you may notice, the machine is not so silent. As you, I probably knew this, so the keyboard and mouse cable are really long, like two meter or something. So they probably thought that people want to put it in some other room or corner, I don't know. It's a little bit funny when you see photos with people having it on the desk. I would probably not want to work next to this machine unless I have noise cancellation headphones. So you may have seen in my video about the Revox reel to reel that I could also link in the corner above. I was traveling and visited my parents. I still have some vintage things stored here and there, including a second system board for the SG Octane and it actually had RAM modules, so I also took some SGI part number 9470168 memory modules. I did not take the whole board, I did not remember what exactly was on the board, but the heatsink was significantly smaller, so I guess it is a single CPU module. So I did not bother to take it with me, but I took the memory modules out. Right now it's 512 megs of RAM, the two 195 MHz are 10,000 CPUs. I have no idea how much these are right now. I hope for at least some other 256 megs, which would make up for a quite respectable 768 megabytes. So let's take it apart and see how that goes. As I said in the earlier video, this XIO boards connect to a backplane in the front. They require a little bit of force. If you're interested in all the different I.O. interfaces, I went over those in the first video. You may want to watch this as well. So this is a processor module, dual processor, already quite warm. Huge heatsink, it gets surprisingly hot if you have it running for a bit of a time and pull it out, it's really hot. Two QLogic SCSI controllers that you'll also find in other machines. The SGI ECC memory modules, as this were quite expensive, high-end, state-of-the-art Unix workstations. This are obviously quite large and respected for that time. This are right now 512 megs of RAM. That was, of course, quite a lot for 1997 or so. A standard Dallas clock chip. As I mentioned in this other video, there's IBM compression connectors that are said to be rather fragile and prone to fail. Don't touch, don't clean. I've seen these uh, connectors on other machines already. These are some, some industry standard connectors that you can I think just by off the shelf, I guess. What is rather interesting is that on all of these boards, also on the video chip, I have seen some botch wires running nicely. So you have some fix up botch wire running here and glued in place with uh, hot glue or so and here to maybe a serial EEPROM or something. Going here all the way down close to the clock chip. On the back side is even one more. Here's one more running from some small I see that some 74 LVT27 3DB. Nearly need a magnification glass for this, maybe it's a multiplexer. You have a botch fix up wire running from here. These are the memory sockets all the way down. Nicely rectangular, um, glued in place going here. Probably some kind of transistor all the way here. These are the mechanics for this slot mechanism to snap them tightly in place. It's a really sophisticated design. I'm really surprised to see this kind of botch fix-up wires. It's a rather expensive custom design, obviously. And this for sure is not the first revision. I'm really surprised. Um, let's see the revision of this is... Here you see it's IP30, 030 and then here's some number. 0887005 revision B. I'm really a bit surprised to see all those fix up wires on uh, on a non initial revision. I would have thought they would have fixed this in a second revision. Maybe they did not have enough space anymore for such long wires all the way through the PCB. Um, here is even written hard. Hard is the crossbar switch. Um, here was a compression connector. I wonder if it's written there as well. 
And the other one may be written bridge. It's uh, only a small gap to look through there. There's a chassis ground jumper. Interesting. There you see maybe the SGI label. <clears throat> I only hope I don't touch it too much here. Filming the disassembly for you. Not that we destroy the precious octane for the YouTube video. That would be a pity. Let's plug in the memory modules. Which side goes where? wonder a little bit why they have these color marks. My others also had some here. And the last ones I plugged in have some white like the first one and slightly different one. Looks like they painted over after installing in some machine. Really funny. If we zoom in there, so there you see the back plane with the compression connectors. This is a system ID module. I'm not sure if this is includes a battery. I never disassemble the front, so I'm probably not disassemble the front today. As far as I've seen the side levers pull in the board and fix it mechanically and probably press the boards onto these compression connectors. It has not failed for me yet, but as I said it multiple times, you read everywhere that these compression connectors are so fragile, so I rather want to double check that it still works after each step. I had it so long by now and now that it finally works much better on Linux, I don't want this YouTube video to ruin the machine here for me. So it still switches on. Let's see how much memory we have now. So now I have 768 megabyte, lucky me. And I already wanted to order memory from eBay, so I saved some maybe 50 bucks or so what it is nowadays. So let's pull the graphic card out for you. This side opens up just the same. And this carrier board has space for four XIO boards. So this is a, it's a little bit dusty, was it not? I thought I cleaned it some weeks ago. So this is an impact graphic module. Obviously very sophisticated for a time. One of the early and few 3D accelerators. This entry level option works better on Linux because this has at least some X driver. The more sophisticated V Pro, which is doing this OpenGL on a chip and is interpreting some rather direct OpenGL stream, only has a very basic and slow frame buffer for Linux. So for Linux right now, this impact is a way better option because at least it has some reasonable usable graphic. On this, you can also install texture RAM modules. I think I have no texture RAM, unfortunately, which would not be usable in Linux anyway. On this connector was uh, a video board connected that I took out, which also saves some electricity and fan speed. You can also connect texture RAM modules to this card. Again, on the back plane side, this connects with this compression connectors. On this side, you have space for more modules like SCSI modules and such. And um, in my case, there was a video board, which I show you in a moment. The video board connected to the compression connectors, as well as with plastic flex cables here directly to the graphic card. Also here, the look inside. And here's a view to the system backplane. You see all the IBM compression connectors, where all the XIO modules slot in. The slots are numbered A, B and C. The up arrow guides you for the installation. I'm always a little bit careful slotting this in. It feels a little bit hard to press in, maybe due to the age or just a little bit rough. Not to insert it slightly off. So this is a video board that my Octane came with that was installed there. So this is surprisingly full with botch wires. I'm really wondering if this production one was that low that it was not financially feasible for SGI to spin a new revision because here are really many. I mean this this chip here is probably three connected. Here is one, here is one. I mean they are installed really nicely rectangular glued with what I think is hot glue. With this flex cables it was connected to the graphic board. Need to be careful where to touch it, especially not on the compression connectors. It has some BNC connectors here, video out, video in, reference in, mix through. It has some high density connector here with some camera 
module. Probably should Google one day what exactly connects there. It's a little bit funny, made in the USA and is uh, showcasting US technology full with botch wires. It's a little bit funny to see this American engineering full with botch wires. I would probably then not print it on there so prominently. Um, here, this is some um, Altera FPGA, I guess, copyright 1997. Here's also the product code. Oh, it's 030-1216-002 revision C. And surprisingly, even in this revision C, they have not done away with all the watch wires. But maybe they really run out of PCB space and they could simply not root it into the PCB anymore. One is going here to this. What is it VBAR SGI? This is some VBAR 1 revision B. One watch wire is going there. Here is something that looks like EEPROM or something going here to the Altera FPGA, I guess. By the way, this, this is funny. Uh, if it's seeable, this is. This is really funny there. I hope it is. Otherwise, I need to make a photo. There are two botch wires. One is going at the bottom and one, I think they even bent up the pin and soldered directly on the pin in the air, freestyle in the air there. This is really a phenomenal hand soldering job, especially on a production board. And here is even what looks like a prototype adapter carrier board, what I would think usually adapts an SMC to this um, DIL dual inline package format. Is it even, is there something seeable? I think there is indeed an SMC integrated circuit. Uh, by the way, this way it is maybe nicely seeable. I think there are two SMC integrated circuits on this, uh, what uh, I only used for prototyping to adapt it to breadboards. I'm extremely surprised to see this on a production board. In my opinion, this is one of the funniest and most bizarre and interesting production PCB designs with botch wiring and prototype kind of thing. This is really extremely uniquely interesting. So that is a video board. I hope I didn't touch it too much. What I forgot to mention in the first video, here you can install a PCI shoe box, so they call it, often in slang. Uh, although I personally don't like this shoebox name very much. Unfortunately, I don't have this PCI cage. I hope you can see the there is another IBM compression connector hiding on the system board. So it would of course be nice to have for expansion. Maybe one day I find one for cheap or something. Additionally to the SGI proprietary XIO modules with this PCI expansion adapter box, which by the way stands out then here quite a bit. This is then some other metal cage coming out here, some centimeters. The power supply is here at the bottom and it is really hard to get out. I only got it out once some weeks ago when I made this other video because I wanted to clean it in case some ventilation is too dusty as I had this historic stability issues. But normally it comes with a handle like this installed here, but someone must have removed it already before I got it. Without this handle it is extremely hard to get out. I was pulling here with full force. I will probably not redo it today. Unfortunately, I had to stick a screwdriver in here and really pull on it. I probably will not recreate this for this video. Um, the power supply is not so interesting anyway. It is rather large though. It's a rectangular piece that probably goes about 30 centimeters here into the whole machine with some heavy duty high amp connectors. I guess the original owner removed it because the whole machine was too deep. The handle sticks another two or three centimeters out here. I can imagine it was too annoying for them or they removed it for shipping to fit it into the shipping parcel and not have external forces pressure here and, and bend this. Um, this is already slightly bent here from shipping maybe. I showed it already in the first video. The front comes off like this with the side buttons. This is a power, this is a reset switch that the plastic elements press through. These are the SCSI base. Unfortunately this SGI SCSI trays are hard to find. I only have one. I think this only were used in the Octanes and Origin or something. So exactly these were only used in these two generations of machines and the newer SGI trays that you find more often on eBay only fit on newer machines. This actually has a date stamp here from 96. 
this is a light bar that lights up nicely. They so used regular light bulbs and I think the one light bulb is probably defect. It correctly lights up red during system power on self test, but later I think it should be blue or something. The remaining side plastic cover also comes off by pressing somewhere here. I actually had to read the service manual for this. The nice thing is it comes with a 200 or so page service manual. Otherwise I would not even know that. I only had this off once and the first time I already had to press quite a bit here. This is a really, it's a really funny system. If you were an SGI service technician doing this all day, you probably knew where exactly to touch. But if you do this only once a decade, it's a little difficult. So this is a plastic that comes off. So this is this plastic snappy thing here. So it's probably to press just here at the corner if you want to do this at home. And this is the heavy metal case that makes the whole machine so damn heavy. This is of course a really interesting optical illusion. Everyone thinks this SGI machines are so pretty. Underneath is an extremely rectangular, I would even go as far and say ugly case. And only the plastic cover makes it look so pretty and nice. We can put this back and to disassemble the front panel you would have to remove all the XIO modules, the power supply and then loosen the screws and then it is supposed to come off somehow here. I have never disassembled the front plane here. Maybe in another decade I may do it. Um, here is some regular sub D. Maybe that included some debug signals or something. SCSI connectors, by the way, automatically select the ID here on this SCA connector. So the first slot is ID 1, the second is ID 2. It is even written here. So SGI even noted it down. SCSI ID 1, 2 and 3. And of course with another pretty SGI logo. And as I have no other SCSI tray here. If I needed a second hard drive, I temporarily put here cardboard. It is nearly exactly the height to just slide in a second SCSI SCA drive just here on the cardboard if you are careful. Usually I would advise only for some temporary test and copying and debugging and such. The front comes back on like this. Here is this famous front door that snaps in. Power and reset is to be pressed with some pen or such. The light bar that shines through here. Okay, it still turns on after all this. You see the light bar here is red. I think it should be blue or something like that during normal operations. However, on this it just switches off. So, so it's still booting. That is good. Yeah, you see the Linux driver even blinks the light bar. Maybe some do-it-yourself repair soldering video for the future to come. And now we also get 256 megabyte of more memory to play with and compile things. So this was the inside tour of the SJ Octane. I hope you enjoyed it and don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe for plenty of more videos to come.